good morning sir thank you so my talk would be on bicuspid valves it's actually not a case sir it's a bicuspid valve i have two presentations one is on bicuspid valve and the other one is an accurate neo maybe I, if you want i can give it together or later whatever way you want so i'll start with the bicuspid valve so bicuspid tavi i think uh, it's a very important topic particularly in our country where out of the uh, about 100% of the tavi is what we do nearly 30 to 40% of the cases what we see is bicuspid and bicuspid valves are always very challenging because we know that and the bicuspid anatomy itself is different from bicuspid these patients have uh, you know we have different types of bicuspid depending on type 0 or 1 or 2 depends on depending on that they will have asymmetrical calcification uh, irregular and eccentric calcification there will be a raphe without raphe as well so when there is a raphe the raphe may be calcified the coronary arteries uh, origin may be uh, uh, maybe sometimes abnormal and uh, uh, based on that uh, we also have have many challenges in tavi in doing a tavi so we know that there is a higher risk uh, for annular rupture because the calcification sizing is a major issue and there is increased risk of stroke increased risk of coronary occlusion and also there may be associated iotopathy uh, which uh, can happen in about 25% of the cases and uh, and uh, added to that there may be also abnormalities in the iota the horizontal iota there may be challenges in device delivery and of course the risk of paravalvular leak is a, another big risk in in the eccentric calcium and also when we implant a valve uh, particularly when it is not circular it can lead to long term uh, problems like early degeneration or leaflet thrombosis uh, leading to decreased uh, uh, durability of the tavi valve so and uh, based on these reasons the majority of the uh, trials have excluded uh, the bicuspid valves from all the randomized trials and hence it's not uh, clearly uh, available in the guidelines so how do we uh, approach for bicuspid valve how do we size them it's a real challenge we know that if we oversize we have a risk of uh, rupture as well as we undersize uh, we have a risk of uh, paravalvular leak uh, and also valve embolization so we need to properly size it and also we should achieve a circular Uh, diameter circularity post uh, deployment which will help in uh, better long term outcome in these valves so sizing has always been a challenge so most of us initially started sizing with the annulus but we know that uh, the the structure aortic root can be either a tubular structure or a non tubular structure where it can be a flare type or a tu- or it can be a taper type which means uh, this is a flare type where the the annulus is smaller and the taper type where the annulus is larger so based on that there's some work uh, done by uh, chachi uh, and uh, the bavard registry where they showed that uh, if you, uh, some uh, about 30% of the patients have a flare type and, and a taper type so particularly in the taper type there is a supra iota supra annular area where there is a narrowing compared to the annular area and in these cases sizing can be done according to the supra annular size rather than annular because it can be anchoring of the valve in a higher uh, uh, higher region and hence if we can avoid oversizing the valve which can lead to rupture at this level when you oversize the valve and also lead to long term issues uh, of valve durability so this was a uh, uh, based on the bavard registry it was suggested that we can measure the intercomptional distance and the supra annular area and if we find the supra annular area narrow then you size the bicuspid valve uh, transcatheter valve according to the size 4 mm above the annulus but then uh it was so it was seen that majority of the patients uh, again fit into the type type which means that still annular sizing was quite feasible in about 88 to 90% of the patients and only about 10 to 15 of the patients uh, needed a, a supra annular annular sizing so there are several other methods of sizing and we have very very uh, published papers on this is the lira method what we call as the level of implantation and raphe method which means the measurement is made at the raphe level where the anchoring is supposed to take place in patients who have calcified raphe this is one of the methods used to size in the bicuspid valve also there is another method called the casper method <clears throat> this is based on the calcium algorithm and the presence of amount of calcium the length of the raphe as well as the annulus diameter if the calcium burden is very high then accordingly the sizing of the valve is like to reduce there is a complex formula where you can calculate the calcium score the raphe length the presence of calcium based on that we can size size the valve and decide whether it increase the size or reduce the size depending on the amount of calcium sometimes it is difficult to size the valve exactly based on the annulus alone so we need to think of using other methods such as uh, 
Uh, balloon sizing, which can sometimes be useful. <clears throat> balloon sizing is again a way to increase, say, know the size. <clears throat> so we can do a valvoplasty. <coughs> I'm sorry. So valvoplasty, we can know the where exactly is the waist of the balloon. So if the waist of the balloon is above the antler area, we know that there is a narrowing much above the antlers. And in these patients, the anchoring can happen above the antlers and we can choose the size based on the supraantler area. It also helps to understand whether there is a movement of calcium and the calcium, whether it's moving into the coronaries and we know whether this anatomy, the balloon is fitting exactly and gripping and can anchor the valve at the antler level. So sometimes balloon sizing will be helpful in some of the cases where we have difficulty in sizing, particularly using the CT. Uh, this is again a new uh, method described recently, which is known as a circle method. And uh, it is a very simple and easy method that can be analyzed using premensure and uh, can effectively be very useful in uh, re reducing the complications. So basically, in this example, we have uh, uh, two types of valves virtually we can choose. Uh, this is a 23 millimeter circle, and this is a 26 millimeter, 26 and 29 millimeter circle. So using the 26 millimeter circle, at different levels of the aortic root, the circle is placed. And here you can see the circle is uh, well within the anatomy. Whereas if you use a 29 millimeter circle, you can see the, the, the circle extends beyond the anatomy. And if you use a 29 millimeter valve in this case, the risk of uh, rupture or causing some damage to the root is high. So in this anatomy, we, we decided to use a 26 millimeter valve. So this is quite a simple way to know whether we, which is better for sizing uh, using the circle method. So though there are several methods of sizing the practice with valve, uh, there is a consensus paper which was uh, published recently uh, where they said, uh, as I told you already, the Bavard registry showed that only about 10 to 12 percent of the patients had a, a supra annular narrowing, uh, which is a taper type, requiring a smaller sized valve compared to the annular sizing. So, based on this, the panel recommended that, and also in long term uh, outcome of these patients who were sized larger in the supra annular uh, sizing, uh, the long term outcome was similar to those sized on the annulus. So, based on that, the panel recommended that the bicuspid sizing should continue primarily based on the annulus. Uh, similar to tricuspid valves and however we need uh, long uh, term studies and again in, in borderline cases the circle method is very useful and is recommended to make sure the correct size valve is chosen to avoid complications so where to implant the valve again in those patients who have uh, severe calcium uh, severe calcified raphe uh, we try to position the valve quite high uh, in a balloon expandable valve 90 10 or even 100 zero and a self-expanding valve, it's a zero to one millimeter depth is what is aimed at. And it's definitely not recommended to position above the annulus. Even the anatomy is feasible where anchoring can be done above because these, patients, <coughs> these uh, should be avoided and it should be either a zero, hundred, you know, cannot be above the annulus. So let me show you some of the examples and the challenges and difficulties what we have with the bicuspid valve. Here we are based on the sizing used on the circle method. You can see that uh, we are deploying the valve at a higher level, and you can see the, the and uh, you can see that we have achieved almost a, a, a 90 uh, 10 level, or almost a zero level, almost 100 zero 100 level of very high positioning. Again, uh, it's important to uh, use also in balloon expandable valves the RAO uh, RAO view RAO cordon view, uh, which can help in uh, positioning it high, uh, not only in uh, supra uh, in, in supra and level, but also helps in uh, in balloon expandable valves. And these kind of horizontal anatomies, is, uh, it's very common in like valves and it's very difficult, sometimes challenging to, uh, to, uh, to position the device and to get a, a good position. And you, I can see that how the valve aligns here, we positioned it in a horizontal anatomy. And you can see that when we very, very, very slow deployment is uh, important here. And you can see that uh, while we deploy, uh, the valve nicely centers and we have a quite coaxial deployment because uh, non coaxialities again uh, can happen particularly these kind of uh, horizontal anatomy so this is one of the cases uh, again uh, uh, where we had a high calcium burden extremely high calcium you can see that and uh, here we have a real challenge with the severe bicuspid valve very difficult to use a, a self expanding valve because here there will be a lot of under expansion when we use a self expanding valve the balloon expandable valve is preferred but again, again, the sizing, if you use an oversized valve, uh, again, uh, based on the CT, 
uh, this patient uh, required a 23 millimeter valve. But however, uh, we decided to use a lower size valve, uh, uh, size valve for 23 valve, considering that this patient had a small body surface area and there was anchoring, uh, well, quite anchoring possible with the 20 millimeter valve. Uh, we decided to use to, for, for, for safety, we did use a 20 millimeter valve, which you can see that nicely anchored and we got away with good result uh, despite a huge amount of calcium uh, in this uh, challenging bicuspid valve. Well. Uh, this is one of the patients, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, a safety valve which was done uh, during one of my uh, proctoring where you could see that uh, uh, after deployment of bicuspid valve, well, uh, you can see that there is a significant amount of uh, paravala leak. And uh, if you see in the echo, uh, these, these are multiple jets, which are circumferential small jets throughout the valve. So again, we have calcium, we can get the uh, these kind of paravala leak, which is difficult, even despite uh, post dilating at the at the good size balloon, uh, we still had uh, paravala leak. So we we had to leave this patient uh, because the risk of complications is higher if we decide to post dilate further aggressively. <clears throat> so these are all expected or anticipated issues. And this is one of our patient uh, after the evolute R valve in a in a, in a bicuspid valve with calcified anatomy. <clears throat> You could see that there is a gross under expansion of the valve. The valve is not expanded at all uh, at, uh, at the inflow portion. And uh, hence, uh, this was uh, post dilated. Again, to, to do a post dilation is challenging because to remove the nose cone uh, can cause the valve to pop out. And hence, we had to put in another wire and then use a balloon and then by the side and post dilate. And you could see that we could get a good result. So, again, uh, this post dilatation does help and there's some amount of recoil, but still there's a good expansion of the valve. Uh, sometimes you have very difficult uh, uh, horizontal iota and these challenging situations. Sometimes it's difficult to attract the device, particularly when you use a, a self-expanding valve. Uh, this evolute art platform, we're finding it extremely difficult in spite of a London crystal wire. Uh, if I can see the Oshawa piece in the, the, the iota as well. So using, uh, again, a snare and uh, pulling the valve uh, using the snare, uh, it can help to push the valve inside uh, into the position uh, in sometimes in these uh, difficult anatomies. And uh, uh, again, choosing the valve again is, uh, should be uh, properly done, particularly in these bicuspid valves. Uh, when we use a self expanding valve like an accurate neo, we need to be sure that we adequately pre dilate the valve before we portion the valve. Uh, or otherwise, uh, in these kind of calcified bicuspid valves, you can see that the valve uh, is, is popped out after we deploy uh in this bicus with valve. So then it becomes a more challenge to put another valve, which was done successfully. However, uh, to prevent these issues, proper selection of the cases as well as adequate pre dilatation is very important. And where you can see in this patient, we have deployed uh, another valve, another accurate new valve. And uh, this you can see in good position and there is a good result with uh, no paraval the leak. So valve selection again uh, is uh, again important uh, based on the anatomy. Uh, though there is no particular valve which is the best valve suitable for uh, bicuspid anatomy, uh, we need to understand that there may be a risk of stroke which may be slightly higher with full and expandable valves. And again, the use of uh, cerebral protection device is important in patients who have bicuspid valve, particularly when you have heavy calcium, it's recommended to use uh, cerebral protection device. Pacemaker risk, is, of course, is slightly higher with self-expanding valve. And paravalve leak, again, uh, it may be higher with the self-expanding valve because uh, the radial strength may be slightly lower with self-expanding valves and uh, maybe adequate post dilatation is required. The risk of annular rupture may be slightly lower with self-expanding valve, but again, when we do post dilatation, uh, the risk, of course, uh, persists, but compared to uh, bottom expanded valve, may be slightly low. And to achieve a circularity, as I mentioned, it's very important, and uh, a circularity can be better uh, achieved uh, with the bottom expandable valve and more electricity can happen with the self-expanding valve because of under-expansion. And the risk of coronary occlusion, of course, is uh, high, uh, but uh, in these patients and the bottom expandable valve uh, may be slightly higher because we have the option of uh, repositioning with self-expanding valves, and when the risk is higher, we can always uh, uh, choose a different strategy so, or protect the coronaries. So tracking in difficult anatomies like uh, horizontal iota, uh, and uh, maybe uh, it is easier with the bottom expandable valve because of the presence of the, uh, the valve can be maneuvered uh, using the knobs and can be rotated. And for future coronary interventions, uh, we know that balloon uh, expanding uh, valves are more favorable compared to self-expanding valves. So to conclude, AVI in bicuspid valve is uh, quite feasible and safe 
and uh, and uh, we have seen that uh, both the uh, expanding valves, self-expanding valves, all types of valves are shown to be very effective. Although we don't have any randomized control trials to know the, which is the best valve, but again, uh, there is the, the, on the analyzer sizing. Again, we have now a consensus uh, which says that we can go in majority of the cases we can go with the analyzer sizing, which can give good results. And the newer generation devices, which have a additional cuff, uh, have uh, better results uh, in terms of uh, reduced uh, PVL and gives a good long-term results. And in patients who have a very hostile anatomy with extreme calcification, calcified raphe and B-flex, have the worst outcome and has to be properly selected. And these patients may be set to surgery if the particularly with the STS scores are low. So further randomized trials are, are warranted for long-term outcome and for setting the best devices for bicuspid valves. Thank you. Uh, do we have time for discussion? Yeah. Yeah. I suppose so. We should have some discussion, right? I ask you a question, Rahul. If Rafi is calcified and the leaflets are calcified, would you seriously consider surgery or will you still yeah. be equivalent to do a TAVI? So, uh, I think this is a very important question. And as uh, Dr. Sengitovelu has also shown, if there is a calcified Rafi and calcified leaflet, the outcomes are worse. So if it's a low risk patient, my uh, you know choice would become a surgery for these kind of patient. If it's a very high risk patient and there is no other option, I'll still take a chance and do the procedure. Yeah. This is what I would do. I think that is true. Uh, what do you say, Sangat Velu? Sir, I, I, I exactly agree with uh, what Rahul said. These patients, particularly the age of the patient is again important. Even the age is younger patients should be definitely offered surgery and if particularly have a smaller analyst, these patients will benefit from root enlargement as well. And uh, uh, patients with extreme high risk, of course, uh, uh, they, they can be considered for TAVI uh, explaining the risk. It's not very common to have a small annulus in bicuspid valve. Generally, the annulus tends to be a little larger. And um, the other question is that, Rahul, you said the high risk, et cetera. But two-year mortality in these kind of cases is 28%. Right. which I think is very, very significant. Yeah. So I think, uh, and then we should not underestimate the capabilities of surgeons. Our surgeons are honestly very, very smart people. And they've been handling cases successfully by skill and appropriate physiologic management. So as you are rightly saying, I think there has to be a very honest discussion in the heart team. Yeah. And if surgeon is capable, I think sometimes they've handled 80 years, 85 years, also with good surgical outcomes. So in our experience, and so I think it has to be very genuine. There should not be a rush to do the uh, TAVI if it's a, you know, this kind of anatomy. And I would agree with your Agreed. point. Agreed. You want to, you want to yeah, say something? I, I yep. just wanted to add. Uh, Speak loudly. Yeah. Extremely high risk patients are really benefited with TAVI procedures. And to the my best of my knowledge, you know, patients with bicuspid aortic valve are little younger patients, and they carry little low risk compared to you know, elderly people. So they should be offered surgery rather than uh, TAVI procedure. No doubt, bicuspid aortic wall is a major chunk in our country, like almost one third of the patients with severe aortic have uh, bicuspid aortic wall, which is more uncommon, like it's uh, only two to three percent in Western population. And we do not have much data in the randomized trials, but of course with the availability of newer generation devices, we can see, except for the hard uh, anatomy where there is a lot of calcification, we are getting good uh, successful outcome in even these patients. With, of course, the long-term mortality is there, but I think as the devices will improve, we will have a better outcome.